Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lynn Marsden Atlas, Executive Director of the Arthur Ross Gallery and the University Curator. Today, we're here with artist, photographer, filmmaker, Andrew Moore. And this is the opening virtual event for our exhibition that opens tomorrow at the Ross Gallery, Many Voices, Many Visions. Andrew Moore is known for his large color photographs of urban landscapes. He combines his knowledge of landscape photography, journalism, and documentary photography to create compelling landscapes. His work in film has won him many prizes, including the 2002 Special Jury Prize at the Sundance Film Festival for his documentary on artist Ray Johnson, How to Draw a Bunny. So our conversation today will begin with Andrew and we're, we're going to speak about one of the works in Many Voices, Many Visions, his work, his large, large format photograph called Imagination Station. So welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Lynn. Nice to be here. Thank you for including me in the show. Oh, we're delighted. We're delighted. Um, Imagination Station, that's on view in many, many voices, many visions, is drawn from the university art collection. But that piece is one of a series of images that you photographed in 2008 and nine in Detroit. A second work in this series, Rooftop Party, is installed in the Department of the History of Art at Penn. Can you tell us why you chose Detroit and what you sought to convey about the city in these two large format photographs that we have at Penn? Um, sure, uh, just to back up a little bit, and I think we're gonna address this a, a little bit later, but you know, I had been photographing in uh, many uh, locations abroad, like uh, you know, Vietnam, China, Russia, Cuba, Bosnia, places like that. And um, I had just decided that it was time for me to kind of return home, to come back to the United States and, and work on projects here in places that I felt a more intimate connections, connection to. And so in the summer of 2007, uh, I met actually in Paris, um, young urban explorers, um, Yves Marchand and uh, Meffre, Roland Meffre. And um, they had been working in Detroit for a couple of years, uh, but they were very influenced by my work and especially my pictures of theaters in Times Square. And they uh, asked me to join them, to come to Detroit. And it was interesting because I had actually photographed in Detroit in the early 80s and then had actually worked on some other projects there. So I sort of knew the city and I knew, uh, also had some friends who lived there. And I originally thought, oh, you know, Detroit, it's just kind of empty fields and really cold buildings in the middle of January. But I, but I, I ended up going anyway and I realized that almost right away that it wasn't, um, that these buildings weren't empty at all, but they, in fact, there was a lot of life contained within them, whether it was artists making installations or throwing huge parties or, uh, you know, living in them sometimes that they had been kind of re-inhabited, re reused, reinvented, uh, not to mention that uh, the force of nature uh, had kind of stepped into the void left by man. So there were many things going on in these buildings. They weren't just empty, abandoned structures. There was actually a lot of life in them, which really surprised me and led me to uh, work very um, uh, intensely over a two year period making these images. So that's kind of how I ended up in Detroit. That's really interesting. Um, Suzanne, maybe you could share with us the image of Imagination Station So, uh, you know, one of the things is that um, uh, when I was, you know, th th there was actually a lot more to do. I mean, the book came out at the very end of this project in 2009, but I actually continued to shoot in Detroit uh, through 2010, in fact. And so this image, although it's not in the book, Detroit Disassembled, uh, I certainly wish it had been included, although it was shot sort of in early 2010. And in the background, um, you see the iconic uh, Michigan Central Station. And in fact, you can see, see some graffiti up there that says, uh, save the depot. Um, 
and it's this, so you have this enormous, um, what would have been kind of an office building on top of a, a large sort of Grand Central Beaux-Arts style uh, train waiting area. Um, but what you're seeing in the foreground is that there were these abandoned buildings close by. In fact, the whole area around the train station this time, uh, it, it joins to kind of Corktown, but it, it was mostly very rundown, uh, very, uh, there weren't that many people living in that particular area. Um, uh, we'll get to that in a second. But anyway, these artists had taken these uh, abandoned houses and created artworks out of these houses and called it the Imagination Station in kind of homage to the, to the station itself. So this is another example of a kind of reuse, re-adaptation of uh, abandoned buildings um, in a very creative way. And, um, uh, you know, one of the issues with the station itself was when it was built, which I think is around 1912 or something like that, um, the, uh, they had imagined that Detroit was going to be an ever expanding metropolis. So it was built actually quite a distance from the downtown. And so as the, as the city receded, starting actually in the late fifties, and then as you know, uh, Detroit lost almost two thirds of its population between yeah. 1959 and, uh, and, and the year 2000, let's say. Um, so as the city shrunk, the, the train station became even further and further away from the hub of the city. So it really was kind of out in a kind of no man's land by itself. So um, anyway, I was glad to, to that the uh, university acquired this particular image because it is not, uh, although it's not in the book, it's actually one of the pictures that should, should is very much part of the series itself. Well, and there's, I know that you, you know a lot about Detroit, Andrew, and, and the, so, the central train station has seen a great transformation. Correct, correct. You know, it's not, you know, this is, it's not, this is not that far from Dearborn and from the uh, Ford Motor Company headquarters, which is in a very modern building. It's just a couple of miles. And so uh, I, I think at the behest of uh, William Ford, the fourth, I think, um, Ford has uh, finally acquired this property. There was a kind of, uh, um, default owner um, who, who held on to this, the station and let it decay and was trying to leverage it for to, to be bought out by the city. But anyway, he finally sold the property, Ford acquired it, and they have, um, I don't think the renovations are done, but they've replaced all the windows and they're redoing the main waiting area. And so this is going to become a kind of IT uh, hub a kind of innovation center for Ford itself, which is so appropriate on so many levels. So uh, it, it is truly like the Phoenix. I mean, out of the ashes of Detroit, this, this amazing building has not only been preserved, but it's going to uh, kind of take on an entirely new life. So uh, it's absolutely the symbol of Detroit in, 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 all, in all of its many chapters and histories. That's wonderful because, of course, we all know that Detroit was in bankruptcy uh, yeah. in, I think it was de declared in 2013, but it started really with the, um, uh, the, the removal of the mayor in 2008, I believe, for, you know, all kinds of fraud and corruption. Yeah, recently pardoned, by the way. Just, I was going to say, just about the time that you were photographing there, as a matter of fact. That's right. Yeah, he was, he was mayor in the beginning, and then he he was removed from office. I think shortly thereafter. Right. right, right. So I think it's really fascinating that that these were they two French, uh, young, yeah, very young French kids, and and it was interesting. Their technique was that basically they would go to Detroit. And then they would spend months back in the suburbs of Paris on uh, Google Maps, kind of just reviewing the city block by block and kind of notating, um, you know, buildings that didn't have roofs or looked abandoned and then we'd go back and investigate them. So they did a very thorough investigation, almost a kind of, you know, kind of typological approach, um, which uh, I think is valuable, but certainly that was not, I took a very different tact. I was more interested in the kind of 
metaphorical, emotional, and lyrical values of the buildings themselves. I wasn't really trying to document like every abandoned apartment building or every abandoned theater. I was more um, trying to create a, um, a multifaceted um, uh, kind of a epic view of Detroit, um, a more, I would say more poetic in some sense, uh, and, and certainly more into the metaphor of nature's reclaiming this uh, man-made, uh, this urban landscape. The, the idea, in fact, that you could have wilderness introduced into urbanism was certainly one of the themes that evolved. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, uh, I didn't go to Detroit with that theme in mind. It really evolved out of the work itself, which you'll see in some of the subsequent slides. I was going to say, Suzanne, let's see if we can see Rooftop Party, which is actually in the Department of the History of Art. Right. So this is on top of the Broadwick Tower, which is uh, that big road in the background. That's Woodward Avenue. That's the was actually the first paved um, road in America, I think, in 19, okay, 08 or something like that. Anyway, one of the, and it's, a, it's an enormous artery. I mean, you can see it's like eight blocks wide. Uh, one of the reasons why Detroit didn't really have a mass transit system until recently when they put a light rail system down this road. Uh, but anyway, so you have this major artery coming from the suburbs. In the kind of near background is Brush Park, which was the first sort of suburban development. You know, you have the downtown and then you have these grand uh, brick structured bourgeois homes uh, and, and, and some of the most notorious uh, images coming out of Detroit in the 90s were of Brush Park, where you had these collapsing grand Victorian homes. Um, uh, and then, so anyway, so so in the foreground, you have the Broderick Tower, which at this time was, comp you know, all the wires had been ripped out by the scrappers. And so we walked up 35 floors with oh flashlights. <laughs> yeah, top, and, um, you know, for, you know, you can see, uh, America State uh, Stadium just to the very right hand side. So there's a baseball game going on, you know, so we're kind of looking over at the baseball game and then, you know, some friends are drinking beer. There's the, the graffiti, of course, and it was sort of like, you know, at this time, this is 2008, it was sort of like kids town. It's like the kids kind of owned the city. I mean, there weren't that many people, there weren't that many police around. And so many of the buildings were just kind of wide open. I mean, you could enter almost any building you wanted to. I mean, if you knew, like the owners would put a board up and then the following Tuesday, somebody would rip the board off and then it would go out on a bulletin board. Hey, this building's open. You can get in now. Here's how you get in. And so the kids kind of run amok, ran amok in the city. Uh, but in a sense, they knew it better than any of the uh, public officials as well. So this is kind of a testament to kind of the grandness of the, Detroit landscape, and at the same time, the kind of like, uh, you know, the kids, the kids are in charge. Kids are in charge. Yeah. In 2010, your book, Detroit Disassembled, was released, and these photographs grew some, drew both interest and some criticism as ruin porn. Right. We discussed the other day. In the New York Times, Mike Rubin defined the term as urban decay, as empty cliche, smacking of wireism and exploitation. Yeah. While the National Gallery of Art curator, Sarah Kennel wrote that in Moore's photographs, ruination serves more explicitly as an allegory of modernity's failure. This discussion of ruin porn has continued in scholarly criticism. How do you personally view these Detroit, Detroit? You can tell I have a friend from Detroit. The Detroit works today. <laughs> Um, you know, honestly, when this first came up in 2010, it really took me, took me aback because, you know, I had, it wasn't on my, uh, it wasn't on my radar at all, the sort of ruin porn label. I think it came out and first came out in a publication called Guernica. And basically they were, you know, the, the gist was that we weren't taking the, 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 the causes, you know, the, the, the crisis of capitalism that had brought all this about, um, that, that these photographs were uh, not, um, 
not really addressing the, the, the kind of root causes of Detroit's problems. Um, I felt it was unfair at the time, so, you know, on the sense that, you know, we, anyone who photographed in Detroit was painted with this broad brush of, of being a ruin porn, um, you know, exploiter, let's say. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I was pretty, I was sort of taken aback and sort of amused. I mean, and I, I also think that there was a, a big part of it was a kind of homegrown defensiveness, like, oh, how dare you show our dirty laundry to the world? You know, how dare you show? Because people were shocked by these pictures of Detroit. They, you know, they knew, you know, that Detroit was in rough shape, but they had no idea of the, the you know, that there were 600 factories that were empty, that there were, you know, dozens and dozens of churches, schools, hospitals, uh, apartment buildings, you know, the, just the, the, the vastness of the decay. And, um, and I thought it was interesting. There was an article in the New Yorker uh, about photographing the Great Recession, because also this, this time period aligns with the Great Recession. Absolutely. The yeah. strange thing in Detroit was, Detroit was already in bad shape. And then when the recession hit, I mean, it just, it, it just went to rock bottom. I mean, every time I would go, there would be more and more buildings that were kind of empty or emptied out or, you know, had been trashed. Um, so, uh, you know, so, yes, yeah, so you have the recession. Anyway, the idea of photographing, there was, so, so there was an article in the New Yorker about photographing the Great Recession and, you know, why don't we have images like the 30s? Why don't we have New Deal photography? Why don't we, why aren't we showing the humanity of this? And the writer, um, I'll remember his name in a second, sort of dismissed the, um, the pictures of Detroit of empty places. But I felt that was, that was, that was non-experiential. Having been in Detroit, having seen it, the, met, the emptiness was the metaphor. It wasn't, it wasn't about bread lines. You know, people were home watching their TV. They, they weren't at work. But, the, but the, 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 the scale of emptiness, I mean, I was in the Rouge plant in Dearborn, Detroit in 2008, the summer of 2008. Now this is, a, this is such a vast complex, I mean, you can get lost easily there. And there were times where 100,000 people would be working in that factory on a given day. I was there, there were like a handful of security guards, otherwise nobody was there. And, and that sense of, of that was what was new, this sense of how empty, how emptied out the city was. So for me, that was the metaphor. And then on the other hand, um, I think that in terms of the, the reasons for Detroit's uh, plight is so multifaceted, whether it was, you know, the growth of the middle class and suburban, suburbanization and the highways and the uh, corporations moving their factories to outside of the city limits. Uh, certainly race was one of the major factors, you know, the, the riots and then the white flight to the suburbs. I mean, so many, you know, and then crime. Um, there were so many, you know, I think a photograph can address many issues, but I was looking at the moment in, in this time, you know, like this is what the city looked like then. And so, I mean, I'm less worried about it now, honestly. And I think when I mentioned ruin porn to people now, they're like, oh, what? I've never heard of that. So I kind but, of thought at the time- you was, the, I had not heard your, right. that kind of criticism about your work. So, so you have, thought, yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, no, I'm thinking of the things that you photographed in Havana or in Russia. And, and I don't know whether we romanticize that, you know, as another country. But the work is not dissimilar, if you will, or the theaters of 42nd Street as well. Correct. But I mean, I'm always looking for either like a sign that life continues, that there's something hopeful, that there's something persistent, the perseverance, this idea, especially in, in Cuba, people living in buildings that were basically falling down around them and yet saying, oh, isn't, isn't this a great city? Isn't Havana beautiful? Meanwhile, like they're missing a wall in their kitchen. And but this idea, like the human struggle the, to endure, to, to, to overcome, I mean, 
I have to have that element in my pictures. I, I'm, I'm not interested in just emptiness for itself. I, it's always something that I'm playing off against, whether it's nature or artists uh, or just the kind of human desire to persist and to carry on. I mean, that, that, is, a, that is a motif that is part of my pictures that I feel has to be there. It's certainly in the successful ones. The resilience of people, yeah, and it's absolutely. certainly a timely thing right now. Yeah. Um, I know that we have more more images. I think from Detroit that Suzanne could share, and you may want to talk about those a little bit as well, Andrew. I'd be happy to. I okay. love this one. This is very surrealistic. It is, and this was, <clears throat> you know, speaking about Detroit. Detroit, you know, one of my one of the great themes in for me in Detroit was the kind of topsy-turviness of it. it this, there was a kind of surreal dimension to time. The time it kind of was kind of running backwards and running amok. And so here is a detail from a, a, a high school classroom uh, where some vandals had set fire and <clears throat> the entire classroom was consumed in flames. And it, the, the fire was so hot that it literally melted the face of time. And so you see, you know, one of these standard school clocks, it says it, it actually the brand is National Time, that's the name of this picture. And, you know, uh, the, the glass and the metal of the clock kind of resisted the heat, but that thin plastic face literally melted over the hands of time. And uh, of course, you know, one can't help but be reminded of Dali's persistence of memory, you know. Um, of course, that's what I thought of right away. And, and, and people always think, oh, is this photoshopped and stuff? But, but it's not. It's actually, that's, that was a real object. Somebody even stole it at one point. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is, this was one of the clues. This is, so it wasn't just the emptiness itself, but it was in fact that the world had been turned upside down. Inside out. Inside out, sure. And so here we see the facade of the Michigan Central Station. Um, you know, it's this enormous structure uh, in all its grandeur. And you have this one little lonely figure passing by in the kind of weedy fields before it, you know. So what, what had been and what is, you know, what was at that time. Now, this picture can't be made today. I mean, it, it's, a, it's an entirely different building, but I did want to sort of give like a little hint of, of um, this sort of uh, clash between, you know, the ambitions of the past and what the reality of the present. Uh, this is actually called Detroit Dry Dock. This had been a building where they made um, uh, sort of diesel engines, uh, um, uh, actually, there were steam engines for the uh, boats that uh, were on the uh, Michigan River, and um, this is actually Henry Ford, as a as a kid, worked in this building and learned all about the combustion engine. This is where he was first introduced to the the whole idea of combustion engine. Anyway, so you have this beautiful uh, late nineteenth century industrial interior that's that's. Um, been scrapped and abandoned, and you have a, uh, a homeless man. He's not homeless anymore because this was his home, this entire building. And you can see he's got a little campfire there. He's drying his socks on a, on a board. And then he'd hung this uh, large plastic sheet as a kind of barrier. Uh, but it was so dark that it was a long exposure. And so that plastic sheet sort of turned into like a waterfall. So you have basically an industrial building with a waterfall with the man living underneath it. And this someone called, um, referred to as a sort of malevolent dollhouse, but it is in fact the same building that the clock appeared in it's the old Castec High School, the very famous high school where Ray Johnson attended here and Diana Ross and countless, I mean, it was the, it was the premier um, academic and art school, high school in Detroit. And um, again, uh, the building was basically attacked like like our bodies are attacked by virus. I mean, the building was attacked by scrappers who stole every valuable thing they could, but also it, in, it shows how 
the corruption and the waste of the of this the entire system. I mean, the school um, left all these desks and computers and furniture, um, and they had built a brand new high school right across the street from this, but but neglected to move any of this stuff. Um, this is the UA Theater downtown Detroit. Uh, I believe Gloria Swanson in 1929 opened this by radio from Hollywood. Anyway, one of these grand silent era movie theaters where, you know, when the, when the image was black and white and silent, the, the theaters themselves were great spectacles of color and light and sound, music and so forth. And here is kind of final days. Uh, you have the kind of, uh, so almost kind of Spanish Gothic uh, organ screen hiding what had been the pipes of a major organ and then the holes in the floor are from air conditioning. You know, when it was one of the only buildings that had air conditioning in 1929 was a movie theater. That's why people went to double and triple uh, features. And then this little doorway. And so it's a real kind of um, double take in terms of scale and size and what is it and where are you? And, um, you know, that's an, when people ask me, like, why don't you take pictures in black and white? I would offer them a photograph like this and say, you know, this is, this is not a picture that could be made black and white. No, not at all. And it's beautiful. So this is one of the kind of iconic pictures of mine from this series. It's called Model THQ, which stands for, you know, the, 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 this is the former Ford Motor Company's headquarters when they were building the, the Model T Ford. Um, but this is, could also be called Henry's office because this is Henry Ford's office from the days of when he was building the Model T. So this is in Highland Park. The building dates from like 1914. It was abandoned in 1928 when they moved to the Rouge and basically sparsely used. But this had been the administrative, this was the executive suite of this uh, factory. And um, you can see what looks like um, rusted walls and then a floor that looks like some kind of Indonesian rice paddy, but it's in fact probably Henry Ford's original wool carpet that over 80, 90 years turned into kind of organic matter and moss, carpet moss grew up through it. And those, the patterns are from where the, the seams of the carpet are kind of pulled together. So you have carpet moss. And, and this also reminded me a little bit of that George Tooker painting of the subway where it's this kind of endless warren. It seems to go on forever and ever. But, um, you know, someone called this a kind of post-industrial aesthetic where, you know, the revival of nature is kind of toxic, kind of noxious and, and, and dangerous. And I, and, I, and I appreciate that, that this is kind of a new idea what what nature how it's going to take over this i remember this photograph well and and it's it's so stunning you know in terms of the the way that the moss is, has sort of consumed the rug and taken over the building yeah I say you know the ruin is not necessarily benevolent nature it's, yeah. it's not Absolutely. no it's not like you know rose mccauley and the the romance of ruins you know the the idea of this, you know, a, a ruined church and it's no longer a structure, the roof is gone and it's kind of liberated into becoming this kind of romantic sculptural uh, thing. You know, uh, I found that the revival of nature in Detroit was a kind of double-edged sword. It, it did fill in, but it was, um, it was kind of um, toxic and noxious also, yeah. So since, oh, this is another Detroit picture. Yeah, and this is this is one of the the ones that kind of clearly elucidates this theme about nature's reintroduction into the urban landscape. And so here we see a building um, designed by Albert Kahn, the great industrial architect of Detroit, originally designed to be the. This is right next to the Grand, the um, Michigan Central Station. This was built as a where the, the mail would come. It was like a mail depository for the train station. And there was an underground chute between the 
train station in this building. That's actually how I got in here. I crawled 503 feet through a through a tunnel to get into this place, and um, it was later taken over by the Detroit Public School System as as their book depository. Then that was abandoned, and then again you have the forces of nature and mischief. You know, snow, rain, fire, everything. Um, and so you have all these these books left over, and they're 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 decayed. They're you know they're they're moldering, uh, turning back into organic matter. And out of those decayed books are growing is a grove of birch trees growing. So the title of the piece is called "Birches Growing Birches in Decayed Books." And the idea is that instead of making trees, you know, books out of trees, you have trees being made out of books. And again, this kind of topsy-turvy, surreal, upside-down world of Detroit. Uh, I love this one. Yeah. yeah, and the the street itself was very popular. It was called Walden Street. That's the name of the. And here you have the world's greatest piece of topiary, you know, a house completely consumed in vines. And you see a little bit of the fascia board up there. Otherwise, the house. But there was someone living in here. There, there was an old lady. She was living on the house too. Really? Yeah, I have another picture that I subsequently took of her and maybe one of her grandchildren trying to cut away some of these vines. It was just a hopeless task. But um, again, this, 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 this transformation of what had been an intensely urban, dense setting into uh, kind of almost a folly in this case was really remarkable. Uh, this is uh, called Jane Cooper Elementary School. So in the, in the, in the background there, you see, <clears throat> obviously from its architecture, one of these um, sort of collegiate Gothic uh, <clears throat> elementary schools, typical of the 1920s, I would say, maybe the 30s, but anyway, about that period. And you have to imagine that when this school was built, uh, this this entire neighborhood was filled with two-story wooden working class homes. I mean, these were this was a dense neighborhood, dense working class neighborhood. All the houses are gone, burned, destroyed, torn down, uh, demolished, and all everything that's left is this school. So you have this field of Queen Anne's lace, and you know, the, you know, in a summer thunderstorm. Um, and so kind of all the tropes of kind of romantic painting is landscape painting and then this uh, school. And in school. Oh. Uh, since your work in Detroit, you have produced other photo series and new publications, including Dirt Meridian from 2015 and Blue Alabama in 2019. Right. Since the 90s, you have photographed extensively all over the world but especially in Cuba, Russia, China, and just very widely internationally for many, many different organizations. Did the Detroit series encourage you to explore other parts of America? Uh, yes, I mean, Detroit was, was great. It was super successful and, but at the same time, I felt that you know, I was never gonna find another city like Detroit. I mean, maybe there is one, out there, but not not in my lifetime, not in my culture. I mean, there'll never be, you know, Toledo, Ohio, or Youngstown. I mean, they couldn't hold a candle to Detroit in terms of the the history, the, the architecture, the, the the place in American culture. You know, music and cars, all that. You know, it just so it didn't really make any sense for me to do another kind of urban project right away. I mean, I, I felt I had done it. I, you know, I don't, as an artist, I, I want new challenges, obviously. I don't want to redo what I've done before. And, and it was important to me. So I had, I had been photographing out in the, the Great Plains in the, before I went to Detroit and not very successfully. But I loved this idea of photographing, uh, the, 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 the challenge of photographing nothing, of nothingness. How do you photograph emptiness? How do you photograph nothingness? And so 
uh, I eventually in 2012 met a, uh, a crop duster by profession who was also interested in photography. And we ended up kind of customizing this plane and mounting a high resolution digital camera to the wing and figuring out how to operate it from the cockpit. And we flew thousands and thousands of miles all over the Great Plains. And so this picture, which is called uh, the Yellow Porch, which is, shows the kind of Nebraska landscape in late winter after a drought. So, you know, everything's dry. Everything's this brown, tones of brown and brown and brown with just the last bits of the winter snow. And then the, the yellow porch, you know, probably painted by some woman who wanted to brighten things up around the place because there just wasn't a lot of color. Uh, uh, you know, that's kind of what I was talking about, like that spirit, like, okay, there's something hopeful. There's some, I'm going to persist. I'm going to, I'm going to make, I'm going to make this place my own. Anyway, this was shot from a, a low flying airplane traveling 70, 80 miles an hour. And so that technique of photographing from a low flying plane, you know, not high up where you're looking down, but you're low and you're in the landscape and you have the foreground and the detail um, was kind of the, the, um, the kind of eureka moment when I realized this is how I could do this. This is how I can photograph emptiness. I can, I can show the deep space and still have a narrative element to the photographs. So this is the cover of the book of Dirt and Rigging. And then I think, and then after that, um, so after I'd done, so I'd done Detroit, the urbanism, and then the Great Plains, the landscape. Um, and then I, you know, I'd always had this um, urge to go back to the South. I mean, my have, I have family roots on both sides from the South. I'd lived in New Orleans traveled mm -hmm. south many times. So in around uh, 2012, I started kind of poking around the south in Georgia and the Carolinas and Mississippi and New Orleans. And, and 2015, I, I sort of ended up in Alabama, not because it was the only state I hadn't visited, but I actually met some really nice folks in lower Alabama. And I spent about three years photographing. And it's really about post-civil rights era in this, what had been some of the worst parts of Jim Crow and kind of what happened after desegregation and, you know, I mean, a lot of people left this part of the country and those that remained really has been a very significant change. And there are a lot of progressively minded people in Alabama, even if they won't put a sign out in their yard. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this picture is called, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is called uh, Back Room at the Harmony Club. And this building was originally a Jewish social club um, because the Jews of Selma, Alabama were excluded from the country club. So they, they built this social club for themselves. And there are other harmony clubs around the country as well. Um, and um, it was like a meeting place. It was a place where p any kind of person could come and kind of meet. And so it's, it's a sort of metaphor for um, hope and, and, you know, because I did feel that things had progressed tremendously in Alabama and I, and I admired the people and I admired their uh, willingness to, to see things differently. It's really interesting because we have um, Bruce, three of Bruce Davidson's black and white photographs from 1963. Right. Wow. Um, in the exhibition, one is actually um, the March on Washington, right. but two others are, are are Birmingham, Alabama, and you know the arrests of demonstrators and and you know the the peaceful protests that Martin Luther King and and many other people organized in in the South at that time. So it's it's an interesting juxtaposition there. Yeah, and but. You know the the bravery of those people in this, I mean what they were up against and the, the violence that they confronted I mean it changed it changed the hearts it changed the laws of this country but but I I I have you know endless endless admiration respect uh, for the bravery of those people and what they what they went through and what they absolutely and when we were writing the the wall labels. I was writing about this young woman, which is 
one of the major images, actually it's the invitation and the cover of the brochure. And, you know, I look at her and she's really in her Sunday clothes, you know, she's in a dress, she's got her pearl earrings on, you know, this is not a woman who, who one would take lightly or consider them to be, you know, someone who was not someone you might see on the street, you know? So I think that, that it's a fascinating, I mean, the picture tells it all. Right. And um, as this picture does about the, the Alabama Harmony Club, I see light and, and community around the table. Yeah, and there's also mystery too. Oh, okay. Uh, and now we get to what I'm working on now. Um, you know, I was a New Yorker, I'm still a New Yorker, but I, I lived in the city for 40 years and uh, a few months before the kind of pandemic lockdown, I actually had moved out of the city. I'd moved to my studio to Kingston, New York. And so during COVID, I mean, it's really not, I haven't gotten on a plane in a long time and not really traveling anywhere, but I am actually shooting around my home for the first time in, you know, decades, you know, rather than getting, going to some place and going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I, now I just kind of um, get in my car and, you know, everything is within, let's say an hour. So I'm, I'm this kind of confinement, but on the other hand, uh, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, the, the fable of the, the, the search for treasure and you go everywhere and then it turns out it's in your backyard. You know, this idea, and, and I realized that a lot of the things that I'm interested in were history, architecture, uh, a certain kind of decay, a certain kind of narrative, certain kinds of uh, people, let's say, living on the fringe. Uh, uh, it's, it's, all, it's all here. It's all around me. I just have to search for it in a different way. So anyway, so this is a recent picture. I probably took this a couple months ago. Uh, this is a guy named Eric, and he's He's caretaker of what had been a, a kind of one of these Hudson Valley grand homes and that was later turned into a daytop rehab center. And now it's, uh, it, he's, sort of, he's sort of the caretaker of it and he also stores his motorcycles in it as well. So you've got the grand piano and the abandoned ballroom and the, the, the daytop slogan that says challenge your fears. And then you've got, you know, you know, Eric, the kind of semi-outlaw on his motorcycle. And so, I mean, I, I like it. I, it's the kind of, again, the kind of story that I'm interested in of layers of time and, you know, how things evolve. And, you know, it's, you could say, you know, the barbarians, you know, they're not at the gates, they're actually in the, in the building, but uh, not to put a too fine point on that metaphor, but, um, and he's not a barbarian either, but, but, um, uh, Again, you know, and I'm also interested, you know, this idea particularly of working with a setting, but then also having a figure in that setting. And that's one of the great challenges that I confront all the time is how to photograph spaces, and, but also in, include a figure in a very, in a very natural, in a very uh, meaningful way in those spaces. Okay. This is great because I didn't get to ask you the last question, which is, you just answered. What have you been doing since the lockdown and COVID? So, so this is what fascinating I'm... photograph. Thank you. Yeah. So. Thank you, Andrew. This is a wonderful conversation. And I'm wondering, we have some people in the chat. I think that may, Susanna is going to narrate that for us. Okay. Questions. So I think we'll. I'm sorry, I did a lot of talking. I, you know, if... I'm glad you did. That's why I have you here. Okay, good. Um, so everybody, just, just so everybody knows, the chat, or excuse me, the um, Q&A is open. So if you do have questions, um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A thus far, um, but if you do have questions, um, the Q&A is open. And I can also open, I can try to open the chat and see um, if that is better for people, but um, for now, the Q&A is open. Okay. Great. Maybe in the meantime, if, if everybody's okay with it, I'll ask a question. Um, I really did enjoy the, the movie that you worked on. Um, and when I saw that in your bio, I didn't realize that you had worked on that. 
Um, how was that experience? Wow, that was, I mean, it took seven years to complete that movie. Um, started it in 1996, a, Ray, a year after Ray died. So I never met Ray Johnson, but my, mm -hmm. the guy, uh, John Walter, who I made the film with, he was from Detroit and he knew uh, an owner of a that had um, hosted some of Ray's events. So we, we kind of got started. So, so John comes to me one day in 1996 and says, you know, hey, I want to make a movie about this artist named Ray Johnson. And I had seen his obituary in the Times. And so I thought, well, let me go, let me go check it out. So I went to the Museum of Modern Art to what then was, you know, the card catalogs. And there was, you know, a huge tray for uh, Jasper Johns and another huge tray for uh, Philip Johnson. And then Ray Johnson himself, he had like three cards and they were all in storage in New Jersey. And I called John later, I said, okay, that's perfect. Cause nobody knows anything about this guy. There's nothing there. So we, we did, you know, all the original research. I mean, it was really intense, all the people we've met and both well-known people and other people. Um, it was it was a really it was a really it was a challenge to to get all the material and to make the movie. I mean, I'm very proud of it, but you know, filmmaking it's a, it's it's a collaborative process certainly, and and, and you know, you're really dependent on other, other people. And um, I really haven't made that. I've made some short films since, but that that took a lot out of me. That project, I have to say. I mean, I'm glad to be. Um, working more independently as a photographer. I mean, I, I would make another film again, but I would choose very carefully who I work with. Um, and it's kind of notorious that, you know, Ray Johnson was a pretty difficult figure and it's, it's, it's quite common in documentary films that the filmmaker becomes their subject matter. And so there were a lot of difficult people at the end of the day with that movie, but, you know, I'm still super proud of it. And, and I, I hope, um, you know, I hope it'll get re-released. That's actually kind of what we're waiting for. But I get all kinds of requests from art schools. I mean, a lot, of, it's very inspirational to a lot of young artists to see this movie. And also because it's about somebody who wasn't famous in his lifetime. You know, it's not a, it's not somebody in their grand studio in Sagaponic watching the rain drip off the gutter. It's, it's about somebody who lived in a, on an air mattress in a, in like a, one bedroom house and was a kind of art monk. Absolutely, thanks for answering that question. Um, as a, somebody who has, is both an artist and has taught art, I, that's exactly why I appreciated it. Um, and Karen, Karen is asking, can you talk about the lighting in your caretaker image, the last one shown? Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I am a natural light guy. I, 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 I really, I'm not very good with like, bringing lights and strobes. I mean, they often, people often say, oh, how did you light that? But in fact, um, I am very attuned to the effects of light. And so I had been in that space before and I kind of knew that at the very end of the day, the light would get low enough to kind of come through the windows and, and illuminate that. I mean, and, and you know, I had sort of like 30 seconds to make that photograph in. And the way he's turned his head and the light is just catching one eye. Uh, it's just a miracle. I mean, I feel like great pictures are kind of a miracle. I mean, you're there, you're prepared, but you know, there's always, there's something that happens in the process that it's not fully in your control. And um, the light is certainly one of those, those things. And uh, you know, and also color is so important to me. You know, I'm very dependent on light for the color of a picture, especially when there isn't a lot of color to begin with. So, um, it's something that I'm just super sensitive to and often kind of waiting for or really in a rush to, um, to take advantage of. So Andrew, I wanted to ask you a question about the High Plains. Um, is that the only series that you did uh, literally, you know, from an airplane, sort of that, that bird's eye view, but at a very low level? Right. So. Yeah, yeah, I've never really taken, I mean, I've done a few assignments where I got in a helicopter and filmed or photographed from, but you know, helicopter pilots, they, they really don't like to fly that low. They're always worried about 
people complaining because they're really loud or wires or, you know, obstructions of one thing or another. So, you know, it was actually possible out in the Great Plains to really fly sometimes just a few feet off the ground, especially with such an experienced pilot. Uh, I was never really worried about that part of it. Um, so yeah, it's really my only aerial project. In the Alabama book, I did actually work with a, a drone pilot because, you know, in Alabama, you can't fly a low plane anywhere. It's too many trees and too many people with, you know, shotgun to like- Too many people with shotguns, right? <laughs> no, I'm joking, but, but uh, anyway, so, so drones are actually amazing, but I, I think they have to be used very judiciously, very, you know, not, so that you don't really feel it. You just feel like, wow, how did you get that picture? Um, so I did, so I wanted that kind of, I, in the Alabama book, there are some landscape pictures that are shot with a drone. Uh, they look like they're from just like from a tall tower. Um, and I'm interested in that, but I probably, the thing is, you know, even with the plane, I mean, you, you'll see in the, in the Nebraska book, there's both aerials and then there's, you know, on the ground shots, portraits and interiors and so forth. And I, and I'm still somebody who's interested in the intimacy with my subject. And, you know, when you're in the air, you know, sometimes it's kind of a wash. It's like just a kind of wash of color, a wash of, of scenery. So I, I like to get up close to things and, and uh, aerial photography is not really about being close. It's more of this kind of, you know, grand view. Um, but I'll probably continue to incorporate that into um, forthgoing projects in some way. So with the Hudson Valley project? Well, with the Hudson Valley, yeah. I mean, the, the river itself is such a magnificent um, feature. Uh, and, and really the only way to see it is from the air. But, and it's just a question. I mean, I'm sort of now scouting for vantage points where, you know, to, to bring the drone pilot or somebody similar back and to get like, to kind of employ the motifs of the Hudson Valley School. I mean, there were places like Olana, you know, where Church lived, where, you know, the mountains, the, the profile of the mountains are still the same. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to kind of incorporate some of the motifs of the Hudson Valley School, but in a kind of modern way with a nod towards, you know, that, that we live in 2021, you know? So that's always the challenge to, to, to bring it up to date in some way. Well, I thank you for your resilience in terms of turning to your own backyard and finding the subjects there during COVID. I think all of us have been forced in a different way to approach our lives. Yeah. Um, and finding the work in, in the Hudson Valley is not difficult in terms of the subject matter. It's been well, well documented, but- uh, But finding a new way. Yeah. Finding a new way to present it is is very interesting. And yeah. I'm glad thank you. Suzanne, do we have any more questions before I, I wrap this up? No, I think I think everyone's being pretty respectful of the time. And um, yeah, there's no more questions in the chat or QA. Great. Well, Andrew, I, I thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are very much looking forward to welcoming people at the Arthur Ross Gallery. The gallery opens tomorrow officially to the public. We're asking visitors, if they can, to go on our website to book a timed ticket. We are only permitting 10 people at a time in the gallery uh, with a lot of safety procedures and masks are required as well. Um, but we hope that you will enjoy seeing Imagination Station. Now we know more about the, the piece itself and work of Andrew Moore's around campus as well. And we encourage you also to go on our website. There will be a virtual exhibition that will be mounted. It's not up yet, but it will be online. And we have a whole series of programs throughout the next month and a half that you can join us virtually for. Thank you so much, Andrew. And I really appreciate the time and all of your, your sharing about your current projects and your past projects as well. Thank, Thank you. you so much. You're a real inspiration to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Too. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody.